Fireside Chat, Episode 26, Flames Fest 2013, recorded on October 27th, 2013. <laughs> Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome to another episode of Fireside Chat. This is Dan, and this week, me and my co-host Matt and Luke were at the Flames Fest 2013, the first annual Flames Fest. And for those that don't know, it was an event the Flames held where they let fans come watch a practice... They had a hockey talk segment where Burke and Conroy talked about the team and the organization, and the main event, which everyone was there for, to see the unveiling of the Flames' new third jersey. We recorded a segment right after the third jersey unveiling, which is what's going to be in this week's show. It's a bit of a different format, but I hope you enjoy what Matt and I had to say about the jerseys and the event itself, and a little bit about what uh, Burke and Conroy talked about. Here it is. It's Sunday, October 27th, and we just got out of the Flames Fest, the first annual Flames Fest, where the Flames unveiled their third jersey, the brand new one. Matt, what were your initial thoughts when you thought, saw the new jersey? My first thought was that the jersey had a lot of good elements to it, but that it looked somewhat incomplete. In what way? It looked like the jersey itself had components from other jerseys, you know, like different concepts, and it was kind of like a mashup. And the public relations director guy at the event, he actually said that they did take parts from five different concepts. And usually if a jersey concept isn't good enough to work by itself, usually creating a mashup from that is not going to work that well but yeah he said they worked with Reebok for a couple of years and got five different concept jerseys from the Reebok design team and then they kind of picked the ones they like best so probably not the best way to do a design it's almost designed by committee like in that way yeah. I imagine each one of those jerseys had a very different theme to them and kind of saying I like this piece and that piece and this piece you're going to get something inconsistent yeah and like, it's not a bad jersey. It, you know, it's not the worst jersey we've ever had. And in some ways, it's actually an improvement because, like, there's no vertical striping that, with lines that end nowhere. You know. The striping but, is very traditional on it. Yeah. And in that way, it looks better. But it still had a lot of rough edges on it that if they would have smoothed it out, it would have looked a lot better. Yeah, and I think the biggest change that everyone's going to have to wrap their heads around is the change to the Flames logo. Aside from the horse, this is the first time they've actually changed the Flames logo uh, since the start of the franchise here. And I think this is the first time they've ever done something different with the Flaming C even. And it's the Calgary and script font with the C under it. What would you think of the new logo? It was all right. Like, we've seen something very similar with the Buffalo Sabres, and they're third jersey that they had last season it's okay you know like there's nothing wrong with it it's not a bad look it's just underwhelming it's a different style yeah and you and i were talking before we got on the air i've never much cared for the teams like minnesota's done this who come up with a jersey that looks like it's very retro inspired when the team wasn't around in like the original six days or didn't have a look that looked like that and to me, the Flames never had that old school look. I mean, the the old school look for us was the third jersey last year. So I'm not I, I'm okay if they want to do something inspired by those colors or use the white C again or something like that without the black. But I'm not sure I like this look of let's go back to the old look that we never really had. Yeah, uh, it looked like a middling effort where they were trying to do too many things all at the same time. And that if that this jersey was included in a package where, like, the regular home and away jerseys were replaced with the retro jerseys, then it would have made more sense to do something that was kind of in keeping with the current threads that we have. All in all, it was an adequate 
thing, but, you know, in like 10 years, it'll be easily forgotten. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing, too, is the new shoulder patch, which fans have to see. I can't really explain it to you, but it's a new circular shoulder patch. I'm sure you'll be able to see it online if you look for it. And I think that one of the things that was telling today was the Jim Poplinski interview. When they unveiled the jersey, they brought out all the current players and a bunch of uh, old-timer guys. And they interviewed Poplinski about his thought. And he pretty much said that he prefers the original jerseys, the 80s jerseys. But he also said, and I forget his exact word, something about how, well, not everybody wants a third jersey, but the fans have been telling Ken and Jay that they were really looking for one. So now we have one. And it's here for those that want to participate in the program. So I got the sense, I don't know what you thought, Matt, but I got the sense that Pep and a lot of the guys probably didn't necessarily like the jersey, but they realized its po- its purpose is a marketing tool and a sales tool for the team. And it's, hey, if you want to buy it, here's a whole new stream of things with a new logo and new things we can make money on. Yeah, and realistically, the Flames haven't had a new home and away set since the 0506 season after the first lockout. So, you know... There's only so many things you can do with the same Black Sea. Yeah, you know, and they did clean up a lot of the fans' issues with the, our current home and away jersey. But, it, you know, it like the shoulder patch itself, like if they replaced the Canada and Alberta flags with that on the home jersey, that would look a lot better. But... And I'm not convinced that that won't happen in the future. I think you got to take one step at a time. And they obviously want to unveil the new shoulder patches with this jersey first, but I wouldn't be surprised if next year we see those patches on the home and away jerseys as well. Yeah. Uh, the best part of the jersey to me is the actual shoulder patches. It's quite an inventive design instead of your more typical plain line or, you know, yeah. Or and like using the flags. You know, it's something actually innovative. It's something different. But I mean, the, the flags were innovative at their time too. No one else had done that. Yeah. I think the uh, the other thing that I'm going to be interested to see is how the team performs with these third jerseys. As we know, the last set of third jerseys, the retros, the Flames always played very well. I think they won, what, every game they wore them in for the first couple seasons? Yeah. Well... To me, I don't think that there's really any significance with jerseys. It's more random chance, like how we always seem to lose in Anaheim. But, you know. But at the same time, as we know, hockey players are superstitious people. And if there's a superstition or a belief that they win, who knows? Maybe it makes them play a little bit harder. Yeah. Who knows? And as far as we know, these jerseys will be worn with the black pants, the current black pants, and the black helmet. Yeah. And I think it's going to look a little bit silly because the black pants, the lines on them, are designed to correspond to the lines on the jersey. They go down vertically. So I think having those lines there without anything to connect to them on the third jersey will be a little bit silly. Maybe yeah. they'll just wear a black shell, totally black. I'm not sure. That, you know, if they do something where, like, uh, during the Heritage Classic game where they wore those cream color pants shell. Like, that might make more sense than... But cream doesn't go with this new color scheme. No, I, I know. Uh, but I'm saying, like, in relation to that jersey... Yeah. You know, like, if they do something like that where they're wearing a, a straight black mm. or whatever, you know, because those l- vertical lines do not make any sense with the no, third they don't. jersey at all because they got rid of... Thank God they got rid of those vertical lines. Yeah, and I think it, I mean, in a way, it is a a retro looking jersey or vintage looking jersey in that respect, and that the lines and the patterns on it are very traditional. Yeah. They're not the traditional flames colors because they have the black in there, but if you look historically through NHL, that's more the traditional color scheme and line scheme. Yeah. And one, uh, additional thing that they've changed is the actual letter and number type in with the, actual the new font set. It's used. Yeah, for the, like the first time since the white uh, 04 style jerseys came out in like 98 or whatever. So the numbering is still white. Uh, the numbers on the current jersey are black and the lettering was white. The names are in white and the numbers are in black. On this one, 
the names are white with a one color border, just a black border, yeah. and the numbers are white with a really thick black border. So they've they've kind of gone away from the two color, which they never originally intended to. If you remember, the original red jerseys had black letter, but nobody could read them. So now they've gone to the black or the white lettering and white numbering. So it looks more uniform. But yeah, it's a really weird font. Yeah. Well, one thing that struck me as really odd was the number five. It looked like an inverted S instead of like an actual number five. It was a very strange looking number. Yeah, we just got out of Fanatic and we were looking at all the different jerseys they had. And we saw, I think, every other number that somebody wears. We didn't see a six. We saw a one, a four, a seven, a nine, a two. They all looked okay. Yeah. Different. And to me, the, the lettering doesn't match the vintage look. The lettering is a very modern yeah. typeface to me. So going with this scripted lettering on the front and a very modern typeface on the back is a, a little bit jarring. I think they should have gone with the old kind of block um, collegiate lettering. Yeah. It, you could kind of tell that like there was elements from several different concepts because certain things didn't match other things at all. And like the letter type and the numbers that didn't really keep in line with all the other things in the jersey. Like, it just seemed a little out of place, but not like completely terrible, but you know, it's just weird more yeah. so than anything. You know, I have to give the Flames credit though. I mean, we were told at this event that the Flames received the jersey last December. The first mock-up of it in which they signed off on so they've been holding on to it for a year and in a hockey crazy city like Calgary where the media is all over the flames for leaks of any kind and news of any kind I have to give them credit for holding on to the secret as long as they did yeah I got leaked last month to EA Sports but it had to for the game but they held on to it for a good probably almost a calendar year 10 months yeah and the, their level of secrecy is very good you know it, it's always good uh, to have any shop talk kept in-house so that way, you know, prying eyes don't get wind of anything that they might be doing. Yeah. Well, and Conroy even said that he wore it to a practice. So the fact that he said he wore it and nobody even saw it, they've kept a really good secret that way. Yeah. Um, and the Flames have said today that they have a one-week exclusive. So until the 3rd of November, the only place to get the jersey will be at Fanatic. And then after that, they'll open it up to online retailers, Sport Check, Jersey City, all those places. The other thing, is there anything else you want to talk about with the jersey, man? Uh, not really. It, everybody will see it now, and you can make your own judgments. We have some pictures up, up on our Facebook and our Twitter. If you want to see not only jersey, but the presentation that was done for it, uh, between the official Twitter page, and I think we all post our own pictures as well. Yeah. And we'll probably post something later on our website as well, just to... Yeah, check back there in a day or so, and we should have something. The other thing that we saw was a Hockey Talk segment with Brian Burke and uh, Craig Conroy. And there wasn't much Hockey Talk from Brian Burke, but Craig Conroy, who's now really in charge of Abbotsford, I thought some of his insights were really interesting there. The prospects that he sees as being the most ready were Billings, Horak, and Knight, which... We all talked about Horak and Knight being the most ready um, in our preseason episode. But what do you think about him singling Billings out? I thought that was an interesting name. Well, Billings was a NCAA player who, uh, when he became a free agent, he decided to sign with Detroit. But apparently the Flames were also heavily interested in him. But uh, And uh, Billings was an AHL All-Star last year. But with Detroit's defensive system and you know the amount of talent that they do have, it's just a numbers game where it's unlikely that he'd actually get an opportunity to be in the NHL. And so because the Flames are rebuilding, he has more of an opportunity to actually possibly break into the league. So it's not really that surprising. Like He did have something like 40 points last year in the NHL, so as a defenseman that's fairly good and you know if he can become a solid two-way defenseman in the NHL down the road that's always good yeah and I think that this is a team you and I talked about this before we went on the air today but 
I think anytime you're a young prospect, either a prospect who doesn't have NHL experience or someone like Joel Colburn who has some NHL experience but needs a new chance, coming to a rebuilding team is always a smart thing for your career as opposed to a team like a Detroit who is very much ingrained in the win-now mentality and is looking for guys who are proven and have proven that they can play at the NHL level. So I think anytime you're a young player like that, moving on to a team like Calgary who has a rebuild and a rebuild strategy is probably a good move. Yeah, well, the, the key thing when you're developing as a player is ice time. And if you're on a team like a Detroit or a Colorado or, you know, any of the teams that are doing well, you're not going to be getting a huge amount of ice time. You're likely only going to be getting five to seven minutes skating with their versions of McGratton and Bulma. So, you know, that's not going to net you... You know, and like unless you become an all-star in the seven minutes playing with average line mates, you're not going to get much of a shot. So, you know, coming to Calgary where you have the flexibility of getting 12, 14, 16 minutes a night or even more based on how you play is all good. And, you know, you're more likely to be playing with better line mates who can either finish your chances or set you up for things. Yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, getting playtime either at the NHL level or the AHL level is important. I mean, Conroy talked a few times about how competitive the AHL level is, in his opinion. And I trust Craig's opinion there. I mean, obviously it's not the NHL, but it's still a pretty competitive league. So, yeah, getting playtime in either one of those leagues is what you need, and you've got to show things off. And for young players, the best place to be is the AHL. You'll probably get more minutes there, and you'll play against the caliber of players more at your speed that you'll learn from. Yeah, and, you know, with the AHL, you have the availability to become, you know, like, if you're performing well, you have more of a chance to be out on the first power play unit, the first penalty kill unit, and, you know, hone your offensive abilities, whereas if you're in the NHL, you're going to maybe see 10, 20 seconds of power play time at the end of the power play, if that, and, you know, you'll get used sparingly on the defense of side of things, so, you know, and that's why, like, when people complain about Horak getting sent down, at, you know, instead of being up here full time, well, him getting five or seven minutes on the fourth line isn't going to do him much when he can get 18 to 20 minutes and be the first line center in Abbotsford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, we've talked about the HL guys all throughout the year and I'm sure we will continue to do so, but yeah, I think all of our consensus is that if you're a young player and you won't be getting top six minutes here, send him down to the A. Yeah. The other thing that happened today, and I don't know if there's anything we really need to talk about, but there was a live Flames practice, too, and Matt and I were, were talking about after the event, and we said the only thing that would have been nice would have been to have microphones on the coaches so we could actually hear what the coaches were telling the players. We'd see these stops, we'd see them draw on a whiteboard, and then see the players out to do a drill. So if it's a fan event, we thought that the, the coaches should have been mic'd. Yeah, it would just make it more inclusive so the fans would actually understand going into what they're doing like what they are actually doing and why they're doing it you know like if it's a defensive drill where you know one of the defenders is getting boxed in and like you know and like how to prevent goals against well it would be nice to go oh well, that's what they're trying to do and you know yeah I would let fans see what the team thinks they need to work on yeah. And what the, you know, kind of what the team mentality is on the ice based on what you're practicing. And it was only an hour practice. I imagine that wasn't the full length of a Flames practice. I'm not sure. But even just to have a, you know, yeah, this is what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it and why it's important. And then even to hear the, the feedback from the coaches as they might pull a player aside and that sort of thing. Yeah. And it was also funny during the practice that several players like Yuri Hoodler, TJ Galliardi, and Brian McGratton were, you know, soaking up their claim when they'd actually score a goal or they'd be rousing the fans. So. Yeah, Gratz got a goal and he threw both arms in the air and pumped his fists and it was just a practice, but yeah, I imagine it was just for the fans. Yeah. The other thing was when, who was McGratton was trying to, was it 
Galliardi on the board. You're trying to check him and give him a big hit, and he ended up knocking down Jacques Cloutier. Yeah. So we saw this big coach player sandwich happen. Yeah, and all three of them slid from like the blue line to the red line, uh, the goal line. I mean, so yeah, it was funny. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good though. I think for a lot of fans, it's good to see a Flames practice. And I'd recommend anyone who has never seen one go see one. You can go on the Flames website and they have information about when they are and how to get in. But all their practices are open to the public, I believe. Yeah, and plus you get to see more behind the scenes kind of things and like all the little things that go into the preparation for a game. So, yeah, it's definitely an educational experience for sure. This was the first ever Flames Fan Fest, and I think we both agree that for a first effort, it was a pretty good one. But I think I'd recommend anyone go next year, especially with the same cost. There's only like eight bucks this year, four bucks for your season ticket holder. So I think for that cost, it's a, it's a worthwhile thing for a fan to do on a Saturday or a Sunday. Yeah. You know it'll be on a weekend. So. Yeah, and, you know, like everything, it didn't go off without, you know, a couple of things that they could have improved on. Like, but it was a good like first effort. Mics, yeah. But, you know, it's the first time they've done it, and, you know, it was a good effort. So. And it, it felt very familiar as a Flames fan. I mean, Rob Curry was the host. Brian Burke was there, Connie was there. It felt very familiar. It felt like a piece that the Flames produced. It was all the usual. They played the pregame video. It felt like a Flames event. And much to Luke's chagrin, the Tim Hortons donut finder game. Yes, they had a contest section, and they played the game that they always play during the uh, commercial breaks. So you have to find the donut. And they did the same thing for Pizza 73. And then the third game was a ripoff of the, I don't even know what Price is Right calls it, but the Yodeling game. Yeah. And they had the Yodeling game from Price is Right, but with, but with Harvey the Hound. So I have a feeling that some significant money probably changed hands in order for the Flames to be able to do that one. Yeah. But overall, you enjoyed yourself? Yeah, it was a decent afternoon. Luke Rage quit after seeing the donut game, and <laughs> he yeah. had to take off early. Yeah, that was pretty much the end for him. So between... Uh, Butler and the donut game. Yeah. I don't think he's uh, he's too happy with the Flames live product these days, but hey, that's everyone has their own opinions, right? Yeah. <laughs> We are the boys of chorus, we hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.